Coming to you from the Stream.TV studios in Hollywood, California, Pensado's Place is brought to you by Vintage King, Avid, Recording Connection, and the Blackbird Academy. Brand new ITLs. We're going to unpack all the details from the Pensado Awards. We've got John Legend's guy. You're at the place. It's Pensado's place. Hey, great to see you guys. Thanks for dropping by. It's going to be a lot of fun today. And I uh, can't wait to get going. It's, it's been a crazy week, huh, It's a crazy week. Uh, kudos to you on some of the mixes that you're doing. Oh, and also thanks. the some, video all work. All of them. All of them, of yeah. course. And the video work that you're doing, which we'll tell people about later. Oh, you're, you're killing that stuff. you heard about the Spielberg yeah. thing. The Spielberg yeah. thing okay, is, is incredible. Yeah, okay. we'll tell them about that later. Shall we get to it? Let's do it. Hello, family. How the heck are you? Best wishes to you and yours. Uh, always thanks from Dave and I for liking and subscribing. It's yeah. so, so important. Um, and we're going to be able to come back to you for what you do for us. Shout outs to our Vintage King family up in Detroit and in Nashville and L.A. You know, what's crazy is just down the street from Vintage King in Nashville is the Blackbird Studios and the Blackbird Academy. And it's kind of cool that our, our, our very best sponsors often work together and we can all integrate with them together, big right? Big family, big yeah, family. Yeah, big, exactly, great way to put it. Remember, the Blackbird Campus is the incredible studio complex combined with the Blackbird Academy next door to it and then the Blackbird Academy Live School as well. Quite remarkable. Good things are being cooked up between Pensado and, and our Blackbird family. I was on emailing with John McBride yesterday. We're going to do some sweet stuff. Um, also, congratulations, Recording Connection. Great response to your maiden voyage. We've seen some very touching emails from people who've been yeah. received by folks grateful for the opportunity. Um, congratulations to you. Well done. And more to come. Now, let, let's get right to it and switch gears to the Pensado Awards. So as you can see from behind us, we have... Settled on the Pensado Awards logo. We love it. We hope you love it, too. And I thought it would be a good time for us. Dave and I thought it would be a good time to talk about what's going on. We've been in all this prep mode. We really appreciate your patience. Uh, it's serious to us. We want to make it serious for you. So um, we thought we'd sort of put the three musketeers together. Uh, <laughs> if you don't know the man to my left, you have certainly heard us mention him millions and millions of times. Uh, meet the one and only Will Thompson. Um, as, as a bit of context, uh, Will is first and foremost an engineer at heart, and that's where all this started from. He's an audio guy. Uh, he happens to be a brilliant digital media guy and clearly a co-architect of our success. And, and for Dave, for literary reference, Athos, Porthos, and Aramis were the three musketeers. So this would be the three Pensado musketeers <laughs> back together, correct? I'm really sad you know that. <laughs> uh, well, you know, well, I researched it because D'Artagnan was not really a fourth musketeer. So, <laughs> you know, literary, my heart. literary references for you are always good. <laughs> so, William, Hi. welcome, bro. Thank you very much. How Thank are you, man? I'm great. How I are know, you now you're on the other side of the desk. This is weird. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Being on an old set was, would have been much easier for me than yeah, right here. No, here but I'm, I'm handling okay. <laughs> I'll you're be doing okay. good. You're doing Thanks. good. Thanks. Okay, doing I'm doing good. okay. Um, so, you know, I think just updating the family on the Pensado Awards and kind of where we are and bringing us up all to speed. So we, have, we actually have dates and stuff now, correct? Yeah, so this is real. Yeah. And um, it's exciting. It's this, we're actually doing it. Yeah. So, you know, first of all, everybody, thank you so much for your contributions. It's people like you that really made this happen. This is a reality because of you guys. No doubt. Um, you guys came up with this idea and mm -hmm. approached me, and my jaw hit the floor in mm -hmm. fear. Mm -hmm. And, <laughs> uh, <did> my. <laughs> and yeah. we said, but I think we can do it. Yes. And I think we should do it. Yes. And it's important, and I think it's really important for this community. Yes. And they, we need it. I know we both, we all kind of are just make, making what we want to see. Yes. So, you know, everybody, th thank you so much to all you guys, really. I mean, it is the... Um, Th thank you for your patience with, you know, the merchandise. And, and this is our first foray into all of this, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. we are making this happen. You guys have 
enabled us to get this thing started. No doubt. We've been able to hire the right professionals and yep. put on these award shows because I've never done it. Yep. And yep. Um, it's happening. Yep. Um, we literally, in fact, here are some specifics. So um, June 28th is when we're going to do this show. And we did it specifically then. We wanted to give you plenty of time to make travel plans. It's in the summer. We're doing it at a very cool hotel called the Fairmont Hotel. It's one block from the beach in Santa Monica. It is absolutely gorgeous. Actually, you Beautiful. took the tour, right? Beautiful. <laughs> I can't believe we're putting it on there. It's, it's awesome. It's yeah, I mean, and, and, and so that you really understand what you've done, um, which is classic Pensadian, um, as you committed to us helping us, we just kept saying, we got to kill this. Like, we can't kill, can't we let, cannot do this. Down. Now, I will tell you that the black man in the middle here, this is a reverse Oreo cookie. Um, I have never been more squeamish about checks I'm writing and the scale and the size of these checks mm. for what we're putting on. But damn it, we are going for it like we do Pensadian. And it's, and it's because the community is, is worth it. So a couple things we'll do for you. If the Fairmont Hotel is not a place you can stay, and we understand that, and we want you to spend money wisely, Will will get, and we'll get to you and to the site, a list of comparable hotels that are close, that are all kinds of budget options so you can spend wisely. Um, we put the ticket price at 50 bucks, uh, which ties into kind of our levels and some of our crowdfunding thing, correct? Correct, yep. And we wanted to do something that was reasonable to help us defray costs, but also not break the bank. L let me give you one example of the team that's come together, and then I want to get Will and Dave's perspective. So because of you, we were able to hire, and you've heard us mention this before, but I think Contextually, you're going to be surprised at this. So Karen Dunn, who puts on the tech awards and the other kinds of things for over 25 years, Pro. she's on board. Robbie Klein of Klein Media, along with Lisa Roy of Rock and Roy Entertainment, probably the finest public relations team in pro audio, literally the cream of the crop. Um, you know, they do the Grammys and lots of high-end audio events and all that kind of stuff. Um, Robbie Hidalgo, who is this force of nature, audio visual guy sat in a meeting and just, we were like, oh my God, blew us away. Um, so from a context standpoint, tell them how the pros who don't have to be doing this have been reacting to this idea. It's been crazy. I mean, I, I, I sit up here and, and I'm excited, but I'm also blown away. Mm -hmm. I'm absolutely blown away by the response that we've gotten mm -hmm. to this. Mm -hmm. And that's what has made this go from the little award show that could to this, to being at the Fairmont on June 28th, and yep. this is happening. And this is gonna be a party. This is gonna be an awesome yep. event for all of us in this community, engineers, producers, writers, audio of any sort. You know, the idea is to celebrate us. Yes. You know, and from our perspective. Because yep. we, you know, the Grammys are great. Yes. But there's more, I think there's more room for that. And mm -hmm. we get exposed to, I mean, you guys more so than I do, but mm -hmm. just from my chair, we get exposed to incredible talent that no one knows about. Mm -hmm. And this is an opportunity to celebrate that. Absolutely. Well, yeah. well put. Perfectly Dave, your, put. Your, your reaction, you've sat in the <coughs> Well, um, I'm just an engineer, so a lot of the machinations behind the scenes to put this thing off have just been uh, amazing and incredible to me. I, I, I mean, I, I thought you could pull this off like $25, $30. I mean, I mean what do I know, you know? Like grab zeros. a couple of folding chairs, invite some buddies over, get a six get pack, a and we got an award show, you know? That's right, that's right. Nah, nah. I mean, this hotel is like, it, oh, I can't wait for you guys to see this thing. It's, um, it, you've encouraged us, you've allowed us, and, and because of your respect for us and the re reciprocal uh, returning of that, respect this thing is, is going to be top notch you're going to be really proud of this not just have fun but you can be proud of what we created together it's 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 humbling the power that you give us and we don't we don't we, we don't, don't take, take it lightly, it lightly. We, we're not but it, it lightly. is expensive Woo! but not in a bad way it's expensive because we deserve it <laughs> yeah that's exactly that's exactly right and the point that i want to make to you about the professionals is this um they do not need this account we can't afford to pay them their normal fees. Mm -hmm. um, these are the cream of the crop. And the passion in which they've approached us exactly resembles the passion which you've approached the show. They see it as the same cause. They, they've literally threatened me and said, oh, no, 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 you're working with me on this. 
this idea I'm going to be a part of. And I know several of them because as I've gotten to know them, they've turned down some much bigger things because they believe in this so much. So all we're saying is, is again, with the Pensado Angels and because of you, we've touched this chord. And the problem with me involved and with, these te with this team is I don't know how to do chord any better than just we got to kill the chord. Like we can't. So I, I got to tell you, your wishes have been transmitted through these cameras and through social media and in interacting with you in ways that we are pretty damn proud, at least at this point, of what we're going to go do. We want you there. The professional response has been stunning to me from Dave's peers, Will's peers, and our peers, people sit at this desk and otherwise, they are into this. To a person. And to the enthusiasts out there, you know, I'm coming, we and Dave and Will are talking about word, other words for amateurs. Um, they are excited about hanging with you. They see this as a family. They see this as a community. So not to beat it to death, but now it's got a body to it. It's got a date to it. It's got a hotel. Yep. And uh, everybody that contributed, thank you so much. And I will be in contact with you in the next two weeks for all the rewards that you have, whether it be physical or digital. And thank you so much for that. And I promise we'll kick that off this week. Yep. We're going to be Google hanging with you. We're going to be doing yep. whatever Will tells us to do. <laughs> Dave and I are going to do. And we got more to do. And by the way, this is your show. We're not done yet. So if you find it in your heart, you find it t with time, or you find it in your pocket place, we got more to do. It certainly has gotten expensive, and this isn't just about money. This is simply this. Um, we feel obligated to make sure this represents you properly and the professionals properly. Either Dave and I are going to take the financial hit and the financial risk, or we're going to find ways to make it happen. That ain't the point. The point is, we got to kill. And we're going to kill this and create a franchise. It's going to be a show that you helped make, that historically you were there at the beginning. And we're going to make this a badass event, I'm telling you. So what happens now is, as we move forward, you know that the watering hole where Will will be overseeing it is fundanything.com forward slash Pensado. Correct. Um, he'll be speaking to you there. We're speaking to you through, uh, through media. We're designing the award, the Golden PA, Pensado Awards. Gonna be hot, gonna be hot. Um, and so it's, 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 it's go time. Uh, we're enthusiastic, uh, we couldn't believe it. William, you know we love you, bud. I'm excited to hand out awards. Yeah, man. Let's do it. It's gonna be cool, right? Yeah, let's it's do it. It's gonna be cool. Um, the Three Musketeers, we've never been on this side of the desk. It is a pleasure. Man, I just flashed back on the little closet we started. <laughs> man, right. We came a long right. way. This, this is like, uh, hold on. This is really going to be incredible. <laughs> thank you, Dave. Thank, thank you for that, for mixing that up. Well, let me just say this to you, my man. This thing has your name on it, and it's because of uh, the guy who you are, and we are uh, honored to be part of this team. And uh, you're going to, this is going to be a legacy that sits back that says Pensado for a long time. Yeah. Pretty cool. Well, I mean, uh, my name has nothing to do with it. It's just how we started out. But where we're ending up is more important than where we started out. Uh, this thing has everybody's name on it. If, if, if this isn't the, the coolest, most fun thing we've ever done, then we've all failed together. I'm not going to take the blame for that. <laughs> so, um, so enough. More stuff back to you. Um, and uh, Dave has put together a hell of an ITL. Let's roll that ITL. Yeah. I used to kind of look at high and low pass filters as kind of like the, the little stepchild of the filter world. But actually, they're very complex mathematically, particularly when you start writing software. And there's a lot going on in these little guys that, that's very, very useful. Now, if you've got 100 cycles in your you're doing it and you're, you're setting your filter, low, your high pass at 100 cycles. If you use an, um, an 18 dB per octave slope, now an octave, you either double the frequency or half the frequency. So 100 cycles, the octave below that would be 50. Now 50 cycles, you'd be 18 dB down if you started out at 100. And, and, and then on and on and on, you, you, you see the, how the math works there. Filters, like I said, they're, they're actually kind of complex, a lot more complex than I thought. Different things can happen at the frequency at which the filter is set. So on a high-pass filter, there can be 
ripple, in which case right at, we're at that curve where it goes from a, a more vertical line to a more horizontal line, you can have ripple effects on the uh, high side of 100, and then you can also have an, a ring or an overshoot, which will actually give you a little boost at 100, and then it'll settle back down. Um, and we're gonna, we're gonna explore some of that with the Mac DSP F2. Let's look at some real world examples now with this uh, Tsung Kim bass part. Pretty close to perfect. Now we've got a couple of low frequencies that we might tame a little bit. And, and I've gone over that you know, with you before about how to match up kick drums and basses. So let's see what we got. Now let's take up Okay, I like that. Now look at my curve. See my curve here? So so I'm using a there's a 24 dB per octave. So remember our math. Here's here's 100 cycles and then it goes all the way down to 10 cycles. And you can see what's going on. Now Let's check that out one more time. Now this peak is going to put a little resonant, it's imitating what happens in the electronic world because in the electronic world it's not a perfect world in terms of uh, resistor, capacitor, and inductance networks. They create rings and overshoots, so watch this. The low end just gets rich and, and, and nice because what we're doing is we're emphasizing the frequency where we rolled off because that's where the part we don't want is now gone. So now we can emphasize that part. Think of it like that. Let's see if we can improve the top end now. Let's get rid of everything we don't need. Okay, I like that. Now, now, sound didn't change too much. We ended up around 2K. Now let's do the same thing. Let's emphasize everything that we like that's right around that 2K area and see what happens. Ooh. Now we're getting, we're getting something that's gonna cut through the mix really well. Let, let's do it, let's do it. Let's do before and after AB. Pretty cool, huh? Just a little simple two knobs. Well, technically four knobs, but you can see that this has application on vocals. It has applications on guitars. Uh, bass I showed you because the bass is a, is a little more subtle and you might not think of it as being something that can that can really help the bass. Something like a, a high and low pass filter, even though they can be pretty simple, they, they're very usable, especially in musical sense, in musical terms. You can, you can remove some of the things you don't need and enhance the things that are left in a very easy economical way and they don't eat up a lot of processing too. And they're very good uh, representations of real world filters too, okay? next time. So guys, take that ITL. As we always say, use it as homework. Use it to make your lives better. And if you have any questions, hit us and we'll get them answered. Um, during NAM, we got a, uh, an, an email from one of our favorite managers who manages Jimmy Douglas. And he said he represented this guy and he was going to be around for a day. And we said, stop the presses. Mm -hmm. We're going to get him in here. So welcome to the desk incredibly talented Dave Tozer. How you doing? How are you, man? Nice you, man. And you happen to be a fan of the show. We certainly appreciate the support. Oh, yeah. I love the show. Oh, cool. How you doing, Dave? I'm a, I'm a fan of Dave's. Yeah. Look, I'll tell you why in just a minute. Shoot. Go ahead. Tell us. Over the next 30 minutes, you'll okay. figure out why. Okay. Um, songwriting, engineering, producing, you all do You do all of those extremely well. How do those, how do you combine those for the creativity? Because you're a very creative person. Yeah. Almost, art, well, not almost, you are artistic you're in your an artist, approach, too. Really. Yeah. 
Um, yeah, it's interesting. I like to, a lot of times when I'm working with artists, I'm sort of writing or co-writing and producing. And so for me, it's just, um, they're, sometimes they're fairly married. I do think of them as different vocations, you know, like mm -hmm. writing, being a, song, a songwriter is a different vocation, but um, I tend to hear the end game fairly quickly if I'm doing something right anyway. And so I'll kind of hear the arrangement I want as we're writing the song, you know, in, uh, in the production. So then it's just kind of a natural extension of, of the writing process, you know. Mm -hmm. And then, like you said, sort of the engineering of it, you know, getting the sounds right, the, the right mood and the right color, you know. And then I actually a lot of times just carry that straight through to the mixing process. So that are all, all the, although they're all separate, a lot of times, um, they're, they are married together for me in terms of just getting the, painting the sonic picture, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And uh, sort of putting the song in the right light. You know? Did all this evolve from the path you took to where, from A to B where you are now? Because um, I, I love your story about how you started. You moved to Philadelphia just to be around more music and then yeah. you were putting on shows at school. You were, yeah. kind of give us a little quick overview of that. Yeah, I moved to Philadelphia. Um, I was playing guitar. That's my main instrument, you know. And um, you're a South Jersey boy. South course. Jersey boy, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, from a really small town in South Jersey, about an hour away from Philly. Did you ever have to go over the George Washington Bridge? The it's the uh, the Ben Franklin. Okay, cool. The, I knew that. Walt I just, <laughs> okay, cool. Yeah. cool, cool. <laughs> um, and so yeah, you know, early on it was a lot of playing, going to jam sessions, meeting people, um, you know, going back to people's houses and just kind of having jams and, you know, trading licks and things like that, you know, what musicians do. And, um, and eventually I started to kind of get into songwriting as well, you know, but also I had an internship at a, at a studio when I first moved to Philly. So that kind of got me um, seeing what recording studios were, you know, because I hadn't really had... Is that the studio you badgered the owner to get the job? Yeah, well, you know, it's <laughs> funny. Um, it's funny, I actually went there kind of looking for um, session guitar work, just right. kind of passing uh -huh. a demo around, you know. And, um, and he was, I think the studio manager had sort of called me back and said, um, you know, your stuff sounds good, but we have a lot of guitar players around, you know, so don't hold your breath too much or anything, you know. But he's like, well, if we need you, we'll call you. He was like, but we need an intern right now, so would you be interested in it? And I was like, yes, Heck yeah. yes I would. And, um, so I interned and you know did the whole thing, learned how to make coffee and vacuum and and just try to learn it's as part much of the as process. possible. And, um, and that's a rich musical scene in Philly, correct? Yeah, it is. And this was a major studio. You know, it had two big rooms, SSL console. I think one the other room might have had a Neve console cutting the two inch twenty four track. And um, you know, and so it was a, quite a learning experience for me. I wasn't necessarily trying to be an engineer. I was more wanting to be on the creative side of music. Mm -hmm. um, not that that's not creative, but um, it was, I just was breaking in, you know what I mean? And, um, and it was great because it really taught me sort of the vocabulary of the studio, the studio etiquette, you know, as, as, an, as an intern and assistant engineer, you sort of learn the etiquette, you know, when to, when to step in, when not to do something, you know, and, mm -hmm. uh, and how to talk, and it really taught me how later how to, you know, sort of speak the language with engineers once I started producing. So then, you know, I knew how to communicate with an engineer, you know, if I was working with another engineer through my experiences of working in studios and assisting and all mm -hmm. that kind of stuff, you know. Did you ever... Uh, it's kind of a secret society, recording studios in some ways. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. No. Oh, yeah. Speaking of secret, uh, Sigma, did you ever get over to Sigma? Yeah, I used to To me, to Sigma that. is like... Uh, Tom Bell and all those great yeah. records that yeah. came out of there, Philly International. Yeah. All those soul records, the OJs and all, even, you know, uh, David Bowie cut oh, some stuff there. Yep. Um, yeah, I did used to do, uh, I have done sessions there and, you know, I knew Mike Tarsia, mm -hmm. Joe Tarsia's son who sort of took it over and Joe, of course, was the, you know, the, the guy who ran the roost there and was the yep. famous engineer there. Yep. And, um, yeah, it's such a great history and a great room. The Abram at Sigma was a, was a great room. And, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and I had a friend who also was an assistant there. And, you know, at times when he could get in and, you know, off hours and play around the gear and stuff, like he would call me up and I'd go over and we'd like sort of, you know, I'd learn the MPC 3000 or something, you know what I mean? Or just mm -hmm. like from like midnight till six in the morning or something while nobody was around, you know? By the way, congratulations on uh, John Legend's uh, Love in the Future. What a great record. I mean, you, you took you. him the next step. Yeah. On the song Asylum, uh, I heard that you started that song with just a kick drum sample for inspiration. Is yeah. that true? 
Yeah, the way that it worked is um, I was just, and you know, it's funny, I can't even remember exactly what plugin I was using now, but I think I had a, you know, like sort of a software plugin and um, a sampler. And I was just sort of dialing through presets. And I, I don't even remember exactly why, but it was just one of those moments where I hit a certain sound, and it was like, poof, and it was like, whoa, and it just inspired a thing. And then um, I think I just started sort of laying the pulse in, and then I probably started playing around with some keys or some progressions, and it kind of just came together. The musical bed for it sort of came together, and then I sort of started getting the song idea on top. And then I think I, think I had John in the next day and sort of played it for him and kind of played him the, the main melodic idea as well, or my sort of lyrical idea. And, um, and he loved it, so we just kind of finished it off together from there. And, uh, to talk a little bit about, um, obviously you've worked with a lot of people, so you, it's not fair to boil your career down to the one relationship. Mm -hmm, sure. But special collaborative relationships in our business, I mean, that's almost the foundation of the Grammys, mm. is how they put people together. So yeah. you guys have a special magic. Talk about when you met and, and how it's influenced your career and vice versa. Yeah, I met John in Philadelphia when he was... Um, going to uh, university, University of Pennsylvania there. Mm -hmm. He was attending school. John actually um, was homeschooled for a couple years, so he started Penn when he was 16. <coughs> um, and so uh, he was pretty young at the time. And I think I met him in, I don't know, his sophomore year there maybe. And uh, I had a, we had a mutual friend, another friend of mine, actually uh, Max Blumenthal, who's a, who's a journalist now. And um, he was sort of telling me about John. He said, you know, there's this guy in school named John Stevens, and uh, he's pretty good, you know, he's kind of a straight-laced R&B guy, but you should meet him, he's really cool. And I was like, okay. So we kind of invited him over, you know, to another friend of ours' house is where we used to kind of go jam and just, uh, you know, just come over to play and check him out. And so he came over and sat down at the keyboard or something, we probably played some Stevie Wonder songs or something, I was like, oh yeah, this guy's good, you know. Right. And, um, and then uh, I had heard a song that he had written like this ballad that he had written, and I was like, wow, that's pretty good. Because I was already starting to like really write a lot myself, and I was, um, you know, I'm a real sort of songwriting aficionado. I really like great songwriting. So that really resonated to me, because I was like, because usually songs aren't great. There's so many songs you'll hear, and they're, they're, they don't stand out, but when you hear something that stands out, you're like, whoa. Absolutely. So I was like, this guy can really sing. He was, you know, nice enough guy. He had written a great song, and I was like, let me talk to this guy some more, you know? <laughs> and I think, you know, we started playing together a little more, and then eventually I started making demos when we started writing songs together. So we kind of spent a lot of time in our formative years as songwriters writing together. So, um, you know, we probably have a relatively similar approach, or, mm -hmm. you know, we can do it in a fairly unspoken way, you know? Mm -hmm. We kind of probably know where each other's headed, um, just having written so many songs together. But that was the start of it, you know? Mm -hmm. and, um, and then we, you know, we sort of started kind of shopping him for a deal, you know? And eventually we, we got involved with Kanye and he got involved and we started doing stuff with him. And, and then Kanye's first album came out and um, that really blew up. Right. And uh, John was, John signed to, to Kanye's imprint mm -hmm. to uh, Sony, Columbia through Kanye's imprint like mm -hmm. the next year in 2004. Right. So then we were off to the races on his project, you know? Yeah. That's, that's gotta be an interesting seat to see. A lot of people don't see the process yeah. from beginning to there. And they don't know how complicated the process is. Like, it's not all roses. It took right? a long time, you know? Like, in hindsight, I know, I can see that it wasn't ready early on. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, when I listen to early demos, I like, the production to me is real whack. Now it's like, oh man, it wasn't ready. But the songwriting was good. I still think the songs were actually were pretty good. And, um, but it just wasn't quite there yet. And John was still, you know, finding himself a little bit too. That He was pretty much there, but he wasn't quite the, like, sort of big debonair star you think of now, you know, he was, he was on his way, you know, mm -hmm. but um, it wasn't quite ready, so, you know, we were shopping it, and labels were interested in it, and they were like, there's something here, but they couldn't fully get it, you know, and, um, you know, there was a lot going on in Philly at that time, the neo-soul scene, D'Angelo, yep. Common being around, roots. Jay Dilla was around, the Roots, yep. um, you know, and we, I used to be at jam sessions with all those guys, you know, I'd, I'd be at a jam session, late night jam session with Amir on drums sometimes, or like, uh, James Poyser playing keys yeah, and killer. Common coming in and rapping or something. Blau, yep, great Blau, singer. Yep, know. absolutely. So that was kind of the scene around, and um, but the stuff we weren't doing, the stuff we were doing wasn't exactly like I wouldn't have put it down in sort of the neo soul no. category. You know right, what I mean? Right, um, right. As you would make think of it. Um, take me through uh, recording John's vocals yeah. because you you you're really good with the psychology of producing. 
but yet he kind of knows all your tricks by now. And <laughs> let's let's start off with He's a the good sport about it. <laughs> let's start off with the signal path. What what Mike take me from Mike to, to yeah, Pro Tools for John. I've over the years um, discovered I really like a, a good U forty seven on him. You know, Telefunken or Neumann U forty seven. Then going into Neve Pre's, I usually like a ten seventy three or ten eighty one, and then. Um, is it like an LA 2A or 1176? I think probably for that album, I'd probably end up using the 1176 on him a lot. And John's got a powerful voice, but what's cool is, you know, you can hit those U47s and they could, they could stand up to him pretty good. And it's got a nice little sort of mid-range bite. You know, John's got a nice growl in his voice, so mm -hmm. that works out well. And then for that album, I actually cut it all tape as well. So that was kind of the last step in the equation. Mm -hmm. And then dumping into Logic from from the repro head of the tape machine. Oh, cool. Yeah. Oh, you, you're dumbing it live. Well, the way I would do it is I would um, get the, the direct digital signal. We'd set up the sound. We'd get the sound how we liked it. Then I'd, I'd mult that to the tape machine. Mm -hmm. and then we'd, we'd just monitor what we're getting off the tape machine and kind of see how hard we want to goose the tape and everything, mm -hmm. you know, and, and get that sound right. Mm -hmm. Once we get that sound right, I don't listen to it. I monitor the digital signal, and we cut both of them. And you got you got latency from the tape machine because, you know, the but gap. But you got something reprint. to line it up with. Exactly. So yeah. the digital signal gives me the the uh, waveform reference, uh -huh. and then afterward, after all the takes are done, everything we're just grabbing uh -huh. the the uh, tape track and then just lining it up, you know. And then if for whatever reason, if I wanted to use the digital track, I have it, you know. So I have both, but usually I end up using the tape because I really like that, and it just gives you the, sound. gives you the voodoo, you know. Yeah. <laughs> but you don't monitor it because of the latency coming yeah, off the repro head and then going back into cool. the. Converter, you know. I'm, I'm, I'm still fascinated by the psychology of producing because that's the difference between a great vocal and a not great vocal. Sometimes, yeah. is there, is, are there techniques? Let's not call them techniques, but are there ways that you can encourage an artist without them knowing it to bring the most out of them? Yeah, I think so. I think that's really important. It's, it's really all about getting them to be free, you know what I mean? And, and mm -hmm. sometimes just the, the, the wrong thing can happen and it can, you know, really close up and then you're like, oh man, you know, you realize it and you're not getting what you need. You know, got to find your way out of the hole, you know. But I think it's, it's um, yeah, it's just trying to set the stage and be encouraging in a certain way. You know, it's, and it's different for different singers. I feel like it's like a, actually a vocal, perform vocal production is almost like a performance art in itself depending mm -hmm. on, you know, what who the singer is, how they're reacting, what mood they're in that day. You have to throw different things at them accordingly, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so uh, the idea is you're just, you're just trying to get the great performance. And, but what's key is you have to know how to push them to the point where you think you can get greatness, but not try to push them beyond what they can do. Because then if, if you're trying to push them to a place they can't get to, and they feel that they're failing at that, then it's like they're going to close up. And, you know? and how do you push? What, what does that mean? Come on, boy, give me some It's more. like, I don't know, you know, it's positive encouragement. You know, a lot of times, my thing is, like, I'll just say, <laughs> if, if I got them doing takes, I'll just say, you know, that was great. Uh, can we hit another one kind of like this or whatever? Or, you know, so I you lied to them. You basically lied yeah, to them. Yeah, you basically lied to them. Okay, cool. Yeah. <laughs> you got to No, uh, No artists watch this show, so you're okay. <laughs> yeah, you're yeah okay. of course. Yeah. <laughs> my career is going to be fine. You know? <laughs> Everyone's going to want to work with me. Um, but you often find yourself being the guy that records a lot of live stuff. So yeah. this doesn't just apply to singers. It applies to the entire process. Absolutely. Just anybody who's given a performance, you know, and mm -hmm. um, whether it's guitar, solo, uh, rhythm section, drums, whatever it is, you're just, you know, a lot of times I'll, the funny thing is sometimes when you have somebody starting it, vocal, drums, whatever it is, and they're starting to get in their zone, and I might hear it and I'll say, okay, we're not there yet. I kind of know where I want it to go, but sometimes you got to let it go through a bit of a natural process from the finer way there. Let them work through it, give them some direction, some encouragement, and you know, by several takes down the line, they're getting into it and you're, you're getting the goods out Cause, of it. Because you, know? you, one of your sort of, your, one of the ethos that you follow is simplicity. Like you, mm, yeah. you believe in trying to distill the process down to as simple as it can be for, for people and just what, remove the clutter? And let yeah, people get to definitely. Because it. it seems at the end of the day, that's, you want a great song, you really just want to, hear a great singer sing a great song, you know what I mean? You mm -hmm. don't want stuff in the way of that. So in terms of arranging and things like that, when you talk about clutter, it's like you want to, um, or at least I think of it, that you want to just pillow around, especially if it's somebody that's a great singer, mm -hmm. a John Legend, whoever, like that's the centerpiece, the vocal, you know? So you just want to like pillow around that with the right instrumentation and have things 
um, step up for your focus at the right times and then, and then go away, you know. So it's managing the listener's focus throughout a three or four minute song, you know. You want different things have to jump into focus and then out of focus. You know? Expanding on what Herb just asked you, you like to create a world for the listener to enter yeah. and, then, and, and then you want to keep them there under the spell. Uh, that, those are your, a paraphrase of your words. Oh, I yeah. found that fascinating when, when I heard you yeah, say that. Yeah, it's almost like you're creating... How do you do that? Well, I think of it like a creating a movie scene or something almost. And, um, and it's just really, I just try to get the feeling of the records I love. When I think about the records I love, they're, that's what they're doing. They're, there's a lot of vibe to them. Um, it's just taking you to a place, you know. It's like you said, casting the spell. So if you're creating some scene, like you mentioned a song like Asylum or something, it's very kind of dreamy and it's got this vibe to it, you know, and it puts you in a certain mood, a certain place. And if that's working, you have to, in the production arrangement, you have to... Uh, make sure you don't misstep and then knock it out of that spell, you know what I mean? You want to keep them enchanted the whole way through, you know, and not lose it. And so I think it's just, just trying to be sensitive to that as you're working through the arrangement and the production and the performances. You know? We talked earlier um, and shared some commonality in, in that just because of moving around and living in two different countries, I just had all these different musical influences, yeah. and you too. Like yeah, you, yeah. I didn't Marshall move around Tucker. in different countries. I know, much, but, but, but just similar regions. Things, yeah. yeah, so you go from Marshall Tucker to Third Base to. Mm. Mm. Pennsylvania qualifies as a different country. <laughs> South Jersey. <laughs> South Jersey. <laughs> South Jersey. To I was Philly. getting there. I was getting there. Yeah, once you get over those two sure. bridges, some things yeah. change. Um, <laughs> Something in the water. Do, does that affect how you approach music and, and kind of because it, it, the things that you pointed out that you like are all things with sort of clear messages and, mm. and stuff where you. Where it, it's broad and diverse, yeah. but all has sort of some through lines to it. We well, mentioned things like the Southern rock, like Marshall Tuck Band or yeah. uh, you know, Leonard Skinner or something like Absolutely. that. So, so my dad used to listen to a lot of rock and roll when I was a kid growing up. So that was always around, and, you know, and I, I know a lot of that well coming up. And then I listened to a lot of hip-hop as mm -hmm. well growing up, really hip-hop. So in some ways you think of those things as two very different things, but in a lot of ways they're very similar in that with, with rock and roll and, and hip-hop, uh, the spirit of it is very kind of similar, you know, the attitude of it and everything. Yep. Yep. And so there's a common thread there that I gravitated to, mm -hmm. like, you know, in hindsight now thinking of it. Um, and I think, if anything, how that informs me is just with versatility, I think. You know, mm -hmm. I've always been one that want to be able to uh, have a few feathers in my cap. Well, know? I'll tell you how, when I think about your work, when I listen to your work, where it, where it informs me is that you can take simple, powerful, open things, like a John Legend, mm -hmm. but there's something in there that is powerful and grabs you, and it's subtle, yeah. and it's nuanced. It, it, is that fair? Is that a fair connection? Yeah, I mean, I'm just, you know, it, at the best of times, you're, you're trying to, like I said, create the spell. You're going for mood. You're, you're creating a, a world for the listener to enter into, you know, mm -hmm. especially if, like, you want some. I really like headphone records. You know, records you put on, there's a lot going mm -hmm. on with headphones. Yeah, it's like a dark side of the moon. Or oh, something. absolutely. And so... That's kind of the benchmark for me, mm -hmm. you know, even with pop records, just make it interesting and, um, yeah, create that world from the beginning. And, and so the, the various influences can just give you options on those things, you mm -hmm. know what I mean, in terms of the ways you can go with it or artists you can work with or whatever influences you bring to the table. You, know? you, uh, you, just, you just led me to something that, that I'd like to ask you. Uh, I'm trying to formulate this question on Asylum, which is... Um, what a great mix, great song, great everything. There's so much going on in the background, like Kimbra, is yeah. that her over in the right speaker? On Asylum. Yeah. Well, Kimbra's on Made to Love. Um, oh, okay. Asylum actually has a lot of um, Mellotron voices in it. Um, oh. So there's like uh, ahs, like ahs, and things like that. Mm -hmm. Like it's Mel Mellotron Like what? Say that again. <laughs> oh. Okay, just <laughs> there's a low, There's a Mellotron thing He's in there. so that's, cheap. <laughs> there's one that's a low man voice that kind of sounds like that, and there's a higher, like, female yeah. voice doing that. So that kind of is back there lurking around, you know. Mm. But there's, the mood of the record is created in the stuff you set behind mm. a yeah. couple of layers on, mm. on that record. Yeah, it, there's it, a you lot. You guys of... check that record out after the show. It's uh, Or pause and go now. It's really, really, really well done. The way the way he layers that that information. What, what else is, there's some little percussive things. Yeah. Is John doing some things in the middle and on the left side? It's, uh, uh, it's not John. There's a lot of... Um, there's some pads and like um, some um, soft synths back there doing stuff. There's this little 
arpeggiated circusy kind of sound mm -hmm. that comes in and yeah there it's a pretty ambitious production or arrangement I should say in terms of there is kind of a lot of things going on in managing and there's a lot of background vocals John's doing some background vocals mm -hmm. so in addition to this layer of like Mellotron yeah. uh, vocals choirs going on in there I also have John and a, and, and our a uh, female background vocalist named Jessica Wilson mm -hmm. singing on it and uh, padding with the Oz and stuff. And then Jessica's singing the the big sort of, you know, orgasmic part in the middle, you know. Mm. And, um, yeah. You know, as you prepare for Batter's Box, quick, tell us the story about 12 Years a Slave. You ended up mixing two songs there, but mm -hmm. there's a there's a correlative story with John and his family and, and, and the yeah. movie, actually. Yeah, it's interesting because... Um, you know, obviously, 12 Years a Slave is about a, a free man who gets sold back into slavery mm -hmm. and then, uh, you know, ends up getting freed again. But um, with John, John um, did a couple of songs on the soundtrack, and uh, John had been on the Henry Louis Gates show, um, Chasing Your Roots, I think yeah. it's called Finding Your Roots. Fabulous and show. And so John discovered when he was on that show that he had ancestors that had actually been freed and then... Um, kidnapped out of Ohio and taken and sold back into slavery. So wow. that story had resonated with him and he wanted to be a part of the soundtrack. Actually, his, his company uh, produced that soundtrack. And uh, he did a couple of songs on it. I think Alicia Keys is on it mm -hmm. and various other people. But um, so, yeah, so... That had to be unbelievable. Yeah, so those performances are pretty great performances. One, one's the acapella performance of uh, Roll, Jordan, Roll. Yeah. And then another one that uh, he had written with an, a UK artist uh, called Fink called Move mm. song. It's a great little song. And so, uh, so yeah, there's a, it's uh, pretty passionate stuff, you know, and he, he was um, dialed in on it, you know, because he, he, it resonated with him. You know? Wow. When you, yeah. when you see that movie, just as a quick aside, the star, one of the stars of the movie who played the, the big plantation owner, mm. this movie was told by English people and their perspective on slavery. And after this guy was in the movie, he was in the editing room while they edited the movie, and he passed out from looking at the scenes of the movie that he was in. Mm -hmm. It is, if you haven't seen the movie, it shows it in yeah, a whole, it's powerful. Yeah, it is. I'm definitely, the description of the movie was powerful. I can imagine yeah, it's it's serious. when I finally see it, how it's gonna affect me. Well, now that we've completely depressed the audience, why don't you, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I did that in the way that. earlier in oh, the show. Oh, you did that earlier? <laughs> yeah. Why don't you tee up, your, tee up your pitcher's arm and let's see how he does. He's a, he's a, he must love sports. Everybody back yeah. there loves sports. Yeah, he's a, he was a little cocky when he came in. I'm like, Dave, you, uh, well, are you familiar with better? Brush him back, yeah. brush him back off the plate. <laughs> don't, don't him brush him back. You know how you usually do. I mean, he went Sherman on me. For, okay. No, from no, 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 no. Be, be, be gentle. Be gentle. <laughs> Piano. Um, oh, a great player. Right, but uh, mm. Steinway. Go. Steinway okay. D. Nice. Uh, bass. I like the old violin basses with uh, flat wounds. Hoffner. Hoffner's kind of thing. Or, or a um, 50s to early 60s P bass. Flat runs, Jamerson style. Jamerson for me, yeah. bass all the time. On the bass, uh, direct, amp, or both? Both, depending. Sometimes both. Uh, a lot of times direct, and then, um, you know, I might put like a, a lot of times I'll put like a Decapitator or Fairchild plug in on it to like give it some, some bite, some grit. To TMI, TMI, TMI. <laughs> uh, strings. Strings. Great arrangement. That's the key. Great arranging. But um, in terms of sound, again, I really like the Fairchild on strings, just putting the glue together. If you get a chance and you can cut them to tape or use it, try out the tape emulations. I really like the uh, uh, UAD Ampex ATR-102 as oh, far cool. as the emulations. Cool. Oh, snare. Snare. And mm. don't give me white noise from Asylum. Oh, yeah. <laughs> white noise snares. Um, you know, the thing about drums for me is I don't like to mic snares up directly a lot of times. I like to do minimal miking, um, and I know I'm supposed to keep these answers quick, but but I like a good mono mono mic on on the bon, on John the kit. Bonham style. John Bonham style on the key with Bonham. I think that makes all the difference. Is drummers that can self mix their levels. Hundred percent. Mm, that 100%. makes the miking easy. Yeah. Okay, tired of these answers. I'm gonna give you a hard one. <laughs> Favorite synth under five hundred dollars. Mm. Try that one, big one. G-Force Mini Monster. Woo! Ooh. Hey. Curveball, curveball. Over the fence. 808. I sampled a, a real rolling. You did? Yeah. Okay. I'm going to lose this. Yeah. Lead vocals. Uh, I love the U-47 going into, uh, it, like I said, cutting the tape. I really love cutting 
through the tape machine on, okay. on the vocals. Background vocals. Background vocals be a similar thing. Uh, grouping them together, again, I like going through something like the Fairchild to just kind of glue them together, add a little bit of bite to them. And EQ, just EQing them to bring the what air EQ? out of them. What EQ? Quick, 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 quick. Uh, <laughs> you know what I love is actually the, um, the Helios oh. EQ. I love the cranking the up the, like, yeah. the UAD. I love yeah. taking 2K or 2.8 and just cranking it up like 15 dB. I Ooh. think they make a, I'm going to check with Vintage King. I think they make a 500 of that. We ought to go buy that. Yeah, I think they do, yeah. Uh, reverb. EMT 140 plate. Stereo bus. Stereo bus, I'm going to say, oftentimes SSL bus compressor. I'm done, Herm. East I Coast tried, boy I came out and sort of, <laughs> sort of cleaned the California clock, brother. <laughs> Sorry, let the team down, Herb. You did okay, man. No, 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 he's good. Right. Your elbow was a little tight at I was going to get him with the under $500. I should have made it two fifty. You know what? We're going to get the rotator cuff surgery <laughs> for you. You'll be back up in a couple of weeks. <laughs> I think two fifty. I've been able to get the same answer. I know. That's right. <laughs> Let's introduce the corner office to folks. Chongor okay. Gons, are you over there, sir? Yep, I'm over here. Chongor. Uh, Chongor. How's it going, guys, just, today? Just know that Chongor was at my house last night at 1.45 in the morning securing our our domain name for the award show. This guy is relentless. Um, <laughs> Swaggy C, what you got for us? I got a bunch of good questions. This right. first one's uh, from, sorry if I'm more to this, uh, The B Show. With guitar being your favorite instrument, how do your musical ideas differ based on the instruments you're writing with? Yeah, a lot of times I write from guitar or sometimes piano or um, like we talked about with Asylum, sometimes it's pulling up a drum machine or a loop. I like break beats a lot too. A lot of times I'll start from a break beat, like a classic break beat. Um, and they'll differ just, the different instruments will give you a different flavor. I think, I think sometimes it's important to try different things to just, you know, get impacted in a different way that'll lead you to doing something different. So, um, yeah, mix it up. It's, it's fun to do, you know. Um, so, Chongor, you got another one? Yeah. Ange uh, Angelo Boltini, how do you keep the workflow ins uh, inspiring and where do you dig for creativity when working with artists? I like to be inspired by the music I love. A lot of times I'll just, I'll listen to music. I'll listen to other things, just stuff that I love and just, it'll make me want to be great, you know, or do great things. So I'm always just going back to, I try to, I think the key is I try to be a music fan first before a musician. Mm -hmm. Because if you really think about it, like that's what gets us all into this in the first place. We love music. We love to listen to it. And that then we, it leads us to being, wanting to be a part of it. So. I try to remember how I listened to music when I was just a little kid and driving to the grocery store with my mother and listening to police records on the radio or whatever it, you know, whatever it may have been. Because you're hearing it as like a sheet of sound and it's just, you're reacting a certain way, it's making you feel a certain way. Now I listen to music and I can, I can hear all the components. You know? Give us two more, Chongor. Emmanuel Raiden, what's the creative process when building up a song structure for its intended emotion and are there any instruments that you turn to for certain emotion? Yeah, I think so. I think over time you can learn um, you know, certain instrumentation gives off certain flavors. I mean, in terms of going for a certain emotion, a lot of times just experimenting, you know, um, trying out different things. But as you work on it long enough, you'll, you'll start to know, like, certain guitars will give you a certain flavor, certain edge, certain frequencies a lot of times give you a certain flavor. Um, you know, sometimes I might put a harpsichord in a pre-chorus because it's going to give a certain plunky thing or a certain lift and something you might not have expected or might not have heard. And, you know, another part. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's cool. Last one, Chongor. Andrew Berlin. When working with, when a new artist wants to work with you, what are the main things you try to discuss with them? That's a good question. Um, I try to get a sense of what they like, mm. um, where, what their influences are. Mm -hmm. You know, just try to get to know them. A lot of times when we're writing with artists, we don't, you know, you're getting married to a stranger, you know what I mean? You're yeah, getting into a room absolutely. with somebody you don't know. And so, um, you really want to just get a sense of what their influences are, who they like, and um, try to have that inform you, you know, try to know what their favorite songs are and mm -hmm. make something that kind of can resonate with them. And then it's just watching their reactions as you're working on things, seeing what resonates, but still trying to lead them a certain way. You know, I like to think of trying to find what's home to an artist, where they're going to fit at home, where they're going to feel at home, and, and place them there in terms of the song or the arrangement or recordings, mm -hmm. you know. I got the last question, which is um, lots of things we're doing all over the country, and we like to teach people and have them meet 
people like yourself who are just so incredibly talented. If we call on you to do some stuff, either on the East Coast or maybe drag you down to Nashville or whatever, can we get you? Yeah, I would love to. Please drag me to Nashville. Uh, okay. Are you kidding me? Uh, absolutely. <laughs> love Nashville. Listen, it'll change your, it'll change your life. I love change yeah. No, no, yeah, I mean, I think what you, know, what you guys do is great, and is, if there's anything I can do to help. Um, um, uh, we appreciate it, man. It is a pleasure yeah. to pleasure. meet you. Such a fan of your stuff. Pleasure, Dave. Um, David, take us home. Guys, I say this every week, and I really mean it. Uh, check out Dave's work. You're going to be very inspired. He's, he's really talented. He, he has a little bit of a different approach than some of our other guests, and I think you can learn a lot from it. Uh, in the process of checking out his stuff, let me know if Asylum is a, a hip-hop song that's really slow or a, or a ballad that's got some hip-hop elements. See you next week.